Good afternoon. And it being 4.03, I will call the meeting of the Public Safety Committee to order. And uh, here today are Councillor Bill White, Councillor Dick Murphy, uh, Clerk to the Council, Pam Powers, and I will be presiding, Warren County. And I will ask, as the first order of business, if there is any public comment. And seeing none. I'd like um, to move that we accept the minutes from the March 2nd meeting. Okay, it's moved to accept the minutes. Is there a second? I will second. And seconded. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. And those who are opposed or abstaining are not here, so I will say that those minutes are accepted. I will announce that we do have audio video recording uh, thanks to NCTV. And also note for the record that Councillor Jesse Adams is unable to attend due to a work conflict out of town. And then take it to the um, item, first item on our agenda, which is a departmental presentation from the building commissioner, Lou Hasbrook. And I'll turn it over to him. Um, the building activity, I'll do two things. Uh, building activity and then some identifying hazards. Uh, building department activities continuing at a a steady pace. Uh, this fiscal year is going to end up being something less than fiscal year 14, which was a, a significant, significantly higher than any of the pri previous years. But um, we're going to still continue at the rate of 2012 and 2013, which are a steady rise over the past five years. Um, the uh, we'll do uh, about. 65, we estimate $65 million in estimated cost of constructions, um, about 3,500 permits for Northampton building electrical plumbing gas. And uh, uh, one thing that's interesting is that about 50% of those permits are for work that's less than $10,000. So out of uh, half of the $65 million, half the permits have only accounted for about $1.7 there are an awful lot of very small permits that come through. Uh, and then, uh, I don't know when they're going to come in. If they came in in this fiscal year, they would increase our revenue significantly. But there's two residential projects in the pipeline on Pleasant Street. One in the Old Northampton Lumber Yard, and the other at the Old Northampton Lodging House. I believe that the Northampton Lodging House project has all its zoning approvals in place, and I think that there, the um, there's some discussions about some design criteria for the Northampton Lumberyard project, but I'm not sure that there are any significant obstacles to that going forward. Also, um, although I could be wrong. That's the well, can it survive its appeal on the little land court problem? Is there no land court problem? Yeah. Oh yes, there is a suit from one of the abutters. But uh, it survived from the other abutters. There was an appeal of the central business architectural approval that survived the planning board at about five to one. So it proceeds to its next adventure. And uh, Smith College is going to also present an awful lot of uh, renovation permits this year, more than that. we're anticipating a lot more than we've seen in years past. Um, I think more today I'd like to talk about uh, identifying uh, potential hazards in city structures, mostly pertaining to emergency personnel response. Um, we, we talked, uh, the, the Kelly Bannister and I have been talking about um, these sorts of things we're looking at. Uh, solar panels 
because and backup generators because even though the power is disconnected at the pole, there's very likely to be electricity available, and uh, that we can um, we've done the initial backwards review of the, uh, what we have on the computer, which is back to 1998, and uh, there's 180, 179 buildings with sol solar photovoltaic systems on them or attached to them, ground mounted, and then there's another um, 60 gener uh, backup generators that have been installed along with the, you know, the institutional ones, and uh, we've got them broken down by map and lot, and the dispatch is going to incorporate them into their emergency uh, response information so they can let the responder know that there's a generator or that there's solar panels. So when they do cut the electricity, sometimes it's obvious. Um, you pull up and the solar panels are on the front face of the roof, but sometimes it's not obvious. And a lot of the backup generators are tucked out behind the garage and they're gas and power, I mean, uh, natural gas power to make are very quiet so that you know, they may not know and cut the power is what turns them on. Um, and then the second thing we've been working with, Chief Duggan uh, started an initiative to identify buildings with like light wooden truss or light steel truss construction. And uh, we're trying to, and because the roofs are, and floor systems are very vulnerable in the case of the fire, uh, falling through uh, uh, a wood truss roof is something that can be, can be awfully dangerous and you know fatal too. And there's about 8,000 buildings in Northampton, and we can't do and we can't inspect them one by one. Uh, so we're going to we're going to try to do some uh, assessments based on age of the building, type of the building. I think age of the building is going to put us to, uh, we're going to get a little bit of information off the um, assessor's database. Um, but I think we're going to be able to get it down to where um, we can cut, we can, we can do the broad strokes on the likelihood and then potentially do an um, inspection using something like Google Earth cruising down street view because you can look at a building and make a pretty good judgment if you actually lay eyes on it as to whether it would have uh, uh, light uh, wooden or light steel truss roof construction. And then I think it's also going to be something that we work with the assessors to try to incorporate into their database as time goes by. Um, and I, it, it also, being able to identify building structure types is something that uh, we're going to also be able to use for other pieces of information. Um, for other uses, we've talked about uh, in the energy sustainability aspect of it, can we identify a particular structure type that's prevalent in Northampton but it's also lends itself to, to a relatively low cost uh, energy efficiency increases. So we're looking at building types is gonna, I think, give us uh, some other tools to work with. Do you think, do you find that we have a lot of the old balloon construction still? It's, yes, yes, we absolutely do. Um, and the assessor's database is difficult to work with. And there are a lot of uh, different fields and I've been working with it, sorting it by any number of different fields. And because some of the because some of it's incomplete, I'm, I know that I'm looking for ranch houses. I know there's more ranch houses in town than there are in the database. So how do we uh, how do we uh, reconcile? Re yeah, how do we how do we get it together? Because we don't. I mean, we're never going to capture everything. We're going to have things. It, it, we're going to come up with a subset that's going to have structures in it that don't that aren't that aren't that don't meet the criteria of applied there's going to be structures that aren't in it that do meet the criteria but how can we reduce it you know? and if we could get an intern who wanted to ride around 
you know, with their little clipboard. I mean, in the end, I mean, no clipboard is a laptop now, but street by street. Yes, no, maybe you know, 20 bucks checklist. Yes. It would really help to, the assessor's software will take photographs of the houses, but they really don't have any in there. That would be helpful to, to load that. Right. Um, you know, Google Earth is not, I mean, yeah, working down the street. Northampton's fortunate that an awful lot of the uh, streets are, have been photographed. It's not easier. It's, it's harder in some of the other towns. Williamsburg, for instance, has essentially nothing but the, you know, the main X. That's, and you can, um, you can now overlay your GIS maps <coughs> on Google systems. To get coordinated, so right. I've got you know. Actually, I mean, Andy Kuzer is working hard to uh, give me access to some of the more sophisticated mapping because um, we we now use Google Earth, which is one, and I've got the parcel overlays uh, and the uh, flood zone overlays. But uh, but uh, there's a whole lot of overlays available in the state GIS mapping, and it's real. It's useful, it's online, it's just slow. It doesn't work as quickly as Google Earth, and it doesn't have the street view function right in it. So it, it could get it all in one pile, but uh, mm -hmm. Google Earth Pro, which is the one that accommodates that, is, is quite expensive, $1,000 a year, I think. And, uh, I mean, $1,000 is not very much driving around, but, uh, no, we actually have use for it. Well, the other thing, and, and this might be something to talk to them about, but the assessors have access to the multiple listing database, which is full of pictures of everything that's been sold. Mm -hmm. I think I went back and got one from 2001 the other day. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of pictures mm -hmm. of houses that they could load into their system. I mean, it would take somebody dead, you know, that's where you could use an intern to sit there and you know, download the pictures and paste them into the assessor software. But they're color photographs and they're pretty much good for a long time. I mean, you know if somebody pulled a permit enough to alter a picture from whatever data was put in there. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I, I, we use everything we can get our hands on, Zillow's not, uh, or any one of those kind of, mm -hmm. we'll go back to the MLS. Yeah, they and they scrape them from the MLS. That's <laughs> usually where they steal them. Well, it, it, I don't think, you know, that's a $1,000 for at least for a year subscription. It's not a terrible expense when you consider that if you also tie in what we're talking about the Energy Commission, it would be in sustainability. Yeah, I think it's $1,000 per seat. So oh, I see. One person. No, it's citywide. Right? Right. 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 it's not right. No, I right. Yeah, the, I mean, because that particularly the trust roof issues, as you said, as we're discussing, we're trying to determine um, the structure types in the city, if you see which ones would benefit the most from uh, promoting um, energy retrofits that reduce consumption, and you know, how we target the market, uh, that which I, well, you know, particularly on the trust roof issue, we have used the fire safety, the fire safety response. Um, the, you know, trust roofs are fairly common post war structures that, that were all the rage. And, uh, it, now, of course, if they do an energy retrofit, that doesn't reinforce the roof, it doesn't make it any safer. There's nothing, there's something spraying foam on the roof. Yeah, that's, that's a little, I mean, there's a, <laughs> there's a small advantage in the sense that um, the insulation will keep the uh, fire from moving to the roof. Right, as quickly as it might have. It's fire retardant too. Um, the, yeah, I mean, the, the, the blown cellulose is, is right. definitely treated with fire retardant. There was a, a sort of a, there was a fire on Rick Drive, and uh, it was interesting because the fire was caused by the blown cellulose insulation surrounding uh, a, 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 light, a, a recessed lighting fixture which wasn't rated for contact with insulation, but the blown cellulose kept the fire inside the box and only, and only burnt a small portion of the ceiling joints. So, I mean, upside, downside. But, but the cellulose will, 
target to spread of flames significantly. I mean, uh, it doesn't improve the structural integrity of the right. firefighters on the roof worried about falling through. Mm -hmm. um, but it, but it might it might help some. Right. And uh, I think you know we're, we're looking at you know capturing data and how much uh, the more. The more answers you have in, your, in, the, in the information you have available, the, the fewer questions that you have to ask yourself. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, uh, an experienced uh, uh, firefighter rolls up to a building. He knows they know what what they're going to see. The 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 solar and the generators is something that they may not be able to see right off. The, uh, and you don't even necessarily go up, you don't even necessarily disconnect the electricity at the meter. Uh, you mostly get it disconnected at the pole um, if, if there's any kind of fire. But if there's a backup generator humming away out back, um, there, even though the power's disconnected at the pole. Mm -hmm. but, but on the other hand, if there's uh, you know some house of unusual construction type that we could that we could uh, get into the database, um, then they, they just, any little scrap of information at some point may well be useful. You know, that kind of almost real time information. Because yeah. the, the it, what's this is not, it used to be ArcView, but they've updated it since then, right? The planning's E R S I or E R S. Yeah, but that has feels for all that stuff mm -hmm. if it's accessible. So. You could, you know, if it has a generator, if it has solar, I mean, that could all get entered in there. If they have access to that when they're out there, okay. they could just punch up the address and it would tell them, you know, uh, 500 gallons of fuel stored in the basement. It could tell them there's a generator behind the garage and, you know, all kinds of good stuff. Yeah, no, it's, uh, and, and we're, we're going from one set of data, which is in a, I guess it's a, a access database. SQL database, we're, we're ex pulling it out, putting it to an Excel, Excel spreadsheet and cutting off as many of the uh, extraneous information as we can and for getting it down to the dispatch people so that they can put it in. We're all working off the map lot uh, mm -hmm. fields, which are the unique identifiers. Yeah, so when you click that, it should be able to tell you, you know, things with fire would want to know, okay. you know, yeah. fire stuff. Could tell you if there's a registered sex offender in the house for police or somebody, you know, whatever. It's a really there's a neat lot system. of information, and and, and uh, you know, it would be. I mean, it's just it's just information that would be uh, useful. <laughs> um, you know, and, the, and some of the you know building permits potentially as time goes by because we have a lot of information. It's just all kind of spread out here and there. We've been, uh, um, there's, the permitting software is likely to get changed. In the city's, the, per, the software that the city uses for permitting is likely to be changed from the GOTMS software we're using now to a, a company called Acela, or Axela, I'm not sure how they work. The soul is the train. Yeah, it's, it's the same letters except right. More C's and fewer L's. <laughs> <laughs> so, where are you going for your interns typically? Say again. Where are you drawing your interns? Where um, from? I, I, when I say interns, I usually mean planning department interns because we okay. haven't had a great deal of luck with interns. So, just mm -hmm. someone from the planning department that they would dedicate down to, or you just ship the work up there and ask them to? Well, we put together a. We put together a a list of information that we want and, and sit down and decide who can come up with it and, and where can we get somebody to go through it. Fire department did interns? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen one there. Um, the planning department seems to have one. Well, they get the planning school so close that they, they get a ready supply of it. Yeah, from UMass that want to come over and. But it's almost as if the work that you're looking for is is kind of IT work, almost more than most planning people, work. Most people that come 
out of college have a lot more IT experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's not very many professions that don't use have a lot of IT involved. Mm -hmm. it's, I mean, it's essentially migrating data from mm -hmm. various systems right. that have commonality. Mm -hmm. And literally Excel, or FileMaker Pro, or even Google Docs all allow for that. Right. But, did transfer systems, you have to assign values to each thing, but it's not that tricky. And most and most college kids have a sense of how to do that. <laughs> we really are coming to an era <clears throat> where all the G-Wiz equipment that's developed over the last 25 years, all working in their own separate silos, are now recognizing the value in aggregation um, and creating kind of uniform filing systems that allow for Uniform access and understanding the systems, or but that's we're at that ugly point where we're trying to mush it all in one place. Yeah. Well, college, college kids learn a lot of skill in music files. Exactly. You know, they pick up a lot of skills that they can use right. in other things. Bad skills on that stuff. Right. Exactly. What is the whole piece of the internet that that doesn't have uh, that that doesn't have published URLs? Like you, you know, when you go when you go and type the numbers into the there's a lot of places you can't get unless you know the numbers to type in. Right. Or these little programs that go from one URL to the next to the next, just sort of fishing along search to discover. Uh, that's, you know, and my godchild who's uh, just she's at GCC, I think she's a sophomore this year, she knows way more about the web than I do, uh, just because she sits around. <laughs> right. We're the poor Search. dinosaurs who really still think it's a marvel. They think it's ubiquitous and think it's right. it's, it's a whole different language for us. We're still kind of, holy cow. Right. Child labor laws, you should suspend the child labor laws because it's all the right. ones that really right. know what's going right. on. Right. Okay. I'm not working their little fingers to the bone and, mm -hmm. and suffering mining disasters. Right. They, yeah. I mean, my, my, uh, Wife's nephew could probably do could do an awful lot of work with one of these with one of these projects because that's what he does. That's why I was thinking we could even draw from the high school. I mean, where if you're at a point where you, it's hard to find someone to actually do this, there probably be a, a work study component for someone to take a specific project like this. You say eight thousand structures in the city. I'm, I'm. That's a good estimate. And there's eleven thousand parcels. And about. Uh, they don't all have buildings on them. Six. No. And then there's about uh, forty high up, say five thousand um, residential structures. So I'm throwing the rest. You know, I'm throwing the other three thousand to commercial or some sort. What about outbuildings? We don't count those. Um, anything? No, we don't count. We don't count. I'm not counting outbuildings. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about parcels with you know structures on a parcel that are principal structures, principal uses. That sounds like a good project. Can I, can I follow up with um, we you know Smith? Just recently announced that they, they've got a fundraising for their plans. They just hired the architect for a hundred million dollar rebuild of uh, Nielsen Library. Mm -hmm. To the extent that we have any influence on that, it's essentially just standard state building code, right? There's no other. We hold no other sway under the Dover Amendment. They they, are, they don't have to apply by zoning. Uh, we have there is the Dover Amendment has the, especially for. Um, for the, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, GL 40A section three, things that zoning may not regulate, but then it does it does say you can't regulate X, Y, Z, A, B, C, educational uses, not, not for profit educational uses among them, but may regulate height, bulk, setback, parking. So there are a lot of pieces that zoning is allowed to regulate and uh, so you look at where the building is, um, a lot of the 
discussion, a lot of the case law comes out of Boston area because it seems like um, although Boston doesn't have the pressure, the Boston's not covered under the Doe Amendment. Um, the, the well, unique Cam experience. Cam Cam yeah, Cambridge, right? Cambridge. Um, so Cambridge. Yeah, they, they got to do a home rule petition to absolve themselves from the, right. just seventy five percent of their land is owned by MIT or Harvard. So. But uh, you know, if we if they wanted to do something that would increase the traffic significantly, we could impose parking regulations. Like that. If they wanted, uh, you know, like a 65-story building, we could probably have a discussion about that because of the height. Um, doesn't mean that we couldn't. Uh, it we would it would come down to like. Can our fire department serve right. Uh, right, right, things right. like that? Um, you can't uh, or, uh, lot coverage. Uh, if although the amount of open space on a particular lot is pretty minimal in the in the uh, in the downtown area, but there's some there's some um, there's some lab, there's some room for for regulations. Uh, and then the other thing is it says reasonable, which, you know, I mean, that's, that re what's reasonable? Well, right. there could be a lot of discussion about what's reasonable. Right. Right. Um, well, but, we, uh, we are limited insofar from any other type of size of development in <coughs> comparison. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one would argue that I think Smith would make the case for putting in the middle of the campus. Mm -hmm. It doesn't impinge. On any other setbacks, other than our own setbacks, uh, we'll, they can make a case it's not going to increase traffic volume any more than the old library is replacing the system. Uh, as long as you're right, as long as they keep under, you know, under a height restriction that doesn't that isn't precluded by our emergency response, it doesn't require us to go out and buy all new rigs and train all new fire fires on uh, how to respond to large, super large structure fires. Um, pretty limited in that respect. I thought that the, I didn't. I I don't know. I've only seen preliminary and that preliminary discussions. It didn't look like it was going to be the a huge right. thing. Didn't I mean? It looked like it was going to be. I mean, I, Nielsen Library in name only. Right. It's not like the renovations to cut existing. Um, but uh, what are they expecting to do with the old building? I thought part of it was incorporated in, or is it? Oh, okay. I thought there was a, it was going to like somehow. I don't know how they're going to do it. I'm not thinking about lots of demo. I mean, so, they're redoing things, but I think they're not like, trashing the whole building. Yeah, like they're tearing down College Hall. I mean, the reason I bring that up, of course, is we've had historically community debates and discussion about um, Smith. Every every time Smith does major development. Or redevelop or tear downs. You know, it impinges on the neighborhood. This does, and this is right in the central campus. But um, then, of course, what was triggered by the $100 million response and the, the, the announcement was a number of people in the public talking to me about it. This is out of your bailiwick, is it uh, payment mode taxes? So it's, it brings up the, the old discussion and argument about that. Mm -hmm. and, Frequently, I've had constituents say that we should invoke zoning restrictions, essentially strangle them and hold them, at, uh, hold them uh, hostage, basically, to negotiate. And the reason that Boston uh, has the most amount of pilots in the state and then second Cambridge is because they actually did, there were no Dover restrictions, and they could literally threaten and impede any development they considered, particularly as the campus is expanded. We don't have that latitude. It's always the case that we're trying to make the people who sometimes have a difficult to try to make their corner work. And Cambridge did appeal to the state, as I said, and got uh, exemption from Dover. But it's Cambridge or Boston. Boston was never covered. That's how the state works. <laughs> special rules. For special communities, but yeah, uh, you, have the, you have the book, the books. Three quarters is Massachusetts, and one quarter is Boston. Yeah. So like, there's all that. There's all that. The commonalities, but Boston has quite a whole section of cars out. 
Então, o outro vai bloquear. Similar with me, it doesn't really apply at the state level. <laughs> Certainly applies. It's a great them. idea, but not for us. <laughs> yeah, they're they're grown ups. You know, yeah. so. I'm yeah. getting far afield. So we are. Um, is there anything more that you think that you'd like to uh, present to us? Um, we have. No, we'll be going. Well, some of us are here for another meeting right after this. We're gonna have our coffee break. I, I have one other question yeah. that's like totally unrelated. But I asked planning this the other day and I got no real response. Um, Do you think you could, with that lead in, you can not say anything about planning? Sorry. <laughs> I, uh, no, I'm, I'm just joking. Oh, no, 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 no. I, no we don't want to anger the evil empire. Yeah. But um, Airbnbs. Anything out there people notice, people have issues? Um, I mean, because you're sort of a flashpoint for people getting well, sent if they have a problem with parked cars or, you know, that kind of thing. And, and the planning, the planners said to me, well, people can rent a room in their house and that's the way we look at it and we're not, it's not an issue for us. But well, there's two, there's two, I mean, most things that have to do with structures have to size one is the zoning aspect of it, the use and then the building code issues the building code seems building codes ambiguous so there is some ambiguity in it but in order to have in order to make it functional we've, we've we're using the idea that three or fewer rooms is what's it's what's called a, a, a bed and breakfast home and it, it's treated like a single family home. Four or more rooms to left is a, a, a bed and breakfast establishment and then triggers the uh, regulations for you know, our, uh, commercial residential apartments or lodging houses. Zoning looks at it a little differently. They don't, I think that they, they don't necessarily have that sharp division of three or fewer or four or more, but there is a process that if you want to have uh, a bed and breakfast and you want a sign on the front that says bed and breakfast, you need to go to the um, uh, planning board for site plan approval or the zoning board for a special permit. There is a function in the, mm -hmm. in the zoning ordinance for, for uh, Bed and breakfast. It becomes a lot of it is local, uh, written up differently, different localities because this, the state hasn't really addressed it specifically in the zoning ordinance itself. But why would you, when you can itself. just go on the internet and self-proclaim yourself, and no one seems to care one way or the other? Well, something like this, we probably might want to have a um, kind of a focused. Uh, presentation of some sort and maybe even have more than just uh, move around this only because um, I would imagine a lot of people would be interested in the discussion. And I was just interested while we had him here because he's so busy I never run into him. Yes. Uh, well, I right. think what you could, I, you, you know, know have, you, have you seen any, have you anything come through your end of, of dealing with the public that has had any issue, has had anything to do with the proliferation of Airbnbs. I mean, I certainly heard a lot of discussion about it, and we're uh, people. And if people ask me about it, I tell them that this is what if you want to have a bread and breakfast. These are two, you know, the split is between three or fewer, or four or more. Building code issues come up when it's uh, if it's three or fewer, it's a home. It's considered single family. If it's uh, four or more, it's a lodging house. If the, if the, the bed and breakfast home can only be in a single family home. Uh, and quite a lot of discussion about it. And then I've heard people complaining about how I got a license and nobody else has to. And I say I can only address a specific situation one at a time. I'm not going to go out and patrol or quote, give people bed and breakfast. And uh, we would deal with it. Um, 
based on the situation. Uh, one of the specific uh, complaints that somebody registered was a, a house that was being rented as uh, you know, for a short term, but um, you know, fully furnished. I mean, refrigerators full. You come in, you rent it for a weekend or a month or however long. We have nothing on that. That is, and you have to you go down to the. Uh, the sort of the uh, resort areas like the Cape and look at how they deal with it and everybody acknowledges it's whether you have a, if you have a single family home and you rent to a single family it doesn't matter if it's right. a day or a lifetime. We've had that that predates Airbnb yeah. it's a new college town with a lot of yeah. people going up and, and Smith School of Social yeah. Work people often come for two yeah. months. And, and right. rooms in a single family home I mean if I, I personally, in terms of life safety, feel like if you're renting a room in your home, um, and then that's not, and if a two rooms or even three rooms in your home, then I don't feel like that's necessarily an unsafe situation. You have your smoke detectors, you have. Mm -hmm. I have more concerns about um, um, renting out, a, say, a detached garage that's been fixed up into a living room. And that those, because there may not, it may not be easy to get out of the place. I mean, it's sort of like Laurel Park. We spend a lot of time up at Laurel Park trying to make sure that you can get out of those places. Um, and, uh, and then um, sort of hostels where, not hostile, but ho hostile. Um, where uh, where there there might be um, you know half a dozen people that don't know each other staying in a, in, a, in a an apartment or even a house and there's no supervision or oversight and but I have come those are the those would be the ones I'd be most concerned about I also haven't been presented with any of those situations. So. These sound like they could actually take a whole meeting if we were to put all this rather than mm -hmm. since we only have about three minutes. We want to. I think what we want to do is set up some. You know, I, I don't know if it, if, it, if it could happen in a meeting, even you know, in a working group, um, where two or three meetings with a whole lot of uh, a couple of three fast computers available to try to come up with what's out there, so what we want to address. Uh, and and the reason, my reason for asking was more or less. I was assuming that your involvement with this might have been people saying, hey, uh, we'd start off as a parking issue, and then somebody call you and say, hey, uh, we don't have any parking spaces in our neighborhood because 123 Maple Street is running it as an illegal B&B, &B, and there's so many people coming and going that I can't park my car anymore, right. and that's how you kind of back into it. Right. Uh, and, well, and that was really my only question: was have, has that manifested itself? No, and nobody's yeah. willing to okay. step up because yeah. it's uh, you know it starts. To, um, I mean, as soon as that happens, it gets it gets a little nasty. Mm -hmm. But it's also been a considerable shakeout since two years ago when it first started. There was a bad print, and everyone thought it was a great way to make start making money. <laughs> then people did it and discovered, wow, it's going to be a spot for it. There's not the same response. The world is not beating the path to our door. They posted prices have gone down on Airbnbs, and the inventory has gone way down hmm. on Airbnbs, principally because of that checkout. It's they're hotter. I mean, obviously, college towns are appealing. Uh, night, but summer's the best time. Sometimes I'm just going to ask that maybe we curtail this discussion since it. Sure. Uh, it's not related to the agenda. Yeah, uh, it's not. Great. And as I said a couple of times, it might warrant a, a broader mm -hmm. discussion mm -hmm. about many things. And if that's okay. Well, I got my answer. So, so was not a, I didn't or? need sure. that. Okay. So, no, I mean, we're going to have to talk about food trucks, Uber, cab yeah. systems, right. uh, Airbnb things, all these new things that come through yes. that everyone's freaked out about and wants to ban right away. Right. So, yeah, yeah, I think we'll we need to talk about right. it. Right, rather than at this, at the, yeah. this short. I think so. And segues, no segues. We have to burn the segues. So, I'm going to ask you for a motion to adjourn. So, we'll... Yeah, okay, second. <laughs> All right. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Very good. Thank you.